Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the British Academy Book Prize Shortlist event in partnership with the London Review Bookshop. My name is Fatima Manji. I'm your host for tonight. I'm also one of the jury members of the Book Prize, uh, and I'm in my day job a journalist and broadcast and author. But tonight is a chance for us to celebrate the authors shortlisted for the British Academy's 2021 Book Prize for Global Cultural Understanding. The prize, worth £25,000, is the British Academy's way of recognising the enormous contributions to the public understanding of world cultures by non-fiction authors from around the world. It was first awarded in 2013. The judging, the judging panel this year was chaired by Professor Patrick Wright, shortlisted four books this year, and we're thrilled to welcome all those authors here tonight ahead of the winner's announcement at 5 p.m. on 26th of October, so look out for that. Over the next hour, we're going to explore urgent and globally significant topics that shine a light on the connections and divisions that shape our environments and cultural identities worldwide. There'll be time for audience questions later in the, in the event, and if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function, submit them using the Q&A function, you're welcome to tweet during the event and please do copy in the Academy's Twitter handle, that's at British Academy, and the London Review Bookshop's handle, that's at LRB Bookshop. And you can also use the hashtag British Academy Book Prize. Nice and long for you, but hope you can remember that. British Academy Book Prize. So a big welcome to our shortlisted authors and thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves very briefly for just about a minute and perhaps share a little extract from your book or tell us what it's about. And also tell us where you're coming to us, uh, where, where you are tonight. So I'm coming to you from a friend's house in Glasgow and I'm gonna hand over to our first author who is Kel Flynn. Hello, hi, I'm Cal Flynn. I'm a writer and journalist from the Highlands of Scotland. Um, although today I actually come to you from a room above a pub in Cornwall where I'm having a very late summer holiday. Um, and my book is called Islands of Abandonment, Life in the Post-Human Landscape. Um, in it, I travel to 13 different locations around the world which have been for one reason or another abandoned for many years. And there I look at the, the ecology and the psychology of abandoned places as I've been describing it. I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs from the book to give you a flavour. In this book, we will travel to some of the eeriest and most desolate places on earth. A no man's land between razor wire fences where passenger jets rust on the runway after four decades neglect. A clearing in the woods so poisoned with arsenic that no trees can grow there an exclusion zone thrown up around the smouldering ruin of a nuclear reactor, a dwindling sea upon whose deserted shoreline a beach has formed of the bones of the fish that once swam in its waters. What links these disparate sites is their abandonment, whether due to war or disaster, disease or economic decay. Each location has been left to its own devices for years or decades. Over time, nature has been allowed to work unfettered, providing invaluable insight into the wisdom of environments and flux. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cal. Let's go over to Mahmoud Mamdani, who's our second author tonight. Thank you. Um, my book is called uh, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of uh, Permanent Minorities. I'll read, uh, I guess, two paragraphs also uh, to give you a sense of uh, some sense of the argument. The author of The Civilizing Process, Norbert Elias, writes of a Chinese visitor to Europe during the Middle Ages, who remarked on how civilized Europeans used miniature weapons to eat at the table. This visitor noted on the basis of his observations that the warrior class appeared to set the model of European culture. That view may be reductionist, but something in it rings true. Europeans have spent hundreds of years spreading civilization with the power of arms. They have everywhere dominated the people they called natives in the name of civilization. The lesson has sunk in, leading those violently subjugated to seek sanctuary in nation states of their own. This nation state has today become the hotbed of violent exclusion. Replacing the nation state with the mere state a legal sovereign with equal treatment of citizens 
does not mean there is no more diversity in the world. It means that diversity is no longer politicized. History makes abundantly clear that culture is not nationhood. Nationhood is the instrumentalizing of culture for purposes of domination. We can have culture without nations. We can have states without nations, but we cannot, but we can only have democracy without the nation state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Over to Sujit Sivasundaram, who's our third author tonight. Hello everyone, I'm in the basement of my house here in central Cambridge and it's really wonderful uh, to join you and um, my book is called Waves Across the South, A New History of Revolution and Empire. And as I think back to the research that I undertook for this book, one memory which I hold very dear is the absolute privilege which I had uh, in holding a brass plate worn by an Aboriginal era woman, Cora. It included an image of a fish and that was probably an indicator of the ingenious skills that era women had in fishing in their canoes, unlike their men. Colonial observers um, who observed this practice at this alternative gender order, in fact, brought in a different order themselves, which was the colonial settler family. They parodied this woman, Cora, as a queen. Meanwhile, they discussed whether Aboriginal Australians were Republicans. So Aboriginal perspectives do not feature in what we understand to be an age of global revolutions, an age which gave rise to the world which we know. So my book follows Cora's story and many, many others like it from across the wide expanse of the Indian and Pacific Oceans to show the ingenuity, skill, knowledge and sensitivity that Indigenous peoples deployed in this era of tremendous tumult globally. And though they faced an empire which sought to silence them by adopting the vocabulary of the Age of Revolutions, Cora and her compatriots continued to assert their place, and they do so yet now. Thank you so much, Sujit. And we're going to be joined by our fourth author, Eddie Glaude, very shortly. I think he's um, currently on a teaching, teaching engagement. So as soon as he's on, we're going to bring him into the conversation. But let's begin with all of our authors that we have with us now. And I should say to everyone that we're going to put links to the books um, in the conversation so you can um, find out more about them. And I really do urge you to seek them out. I have read them all. They are fantastic books. Um, I really think you will enjoy them. So let's let's hear a little bit more from our authors tonight. And um, You've written quite different books, but they do have some common themes. And one of the common themes that we jurors found was that theme of survival. So I wonder if all of you could talk about survival and how that theme comes up in your book and how you think it applies to your particular subject. Perhaps we could start with Mahmoud. Thank you. Well, my book is interested in uh, one of the themes, reconciliation. Reconciliation cannot be between victims and perpetrators. It can only be between survivors. Victims seek justice. Sometimes justice is the name they give to revenge. Sometimes victims and perpetrators trade places, as in Europe after the defeat of Nazism, or Rwanda after the genocide, or in these times after 9-11. The real challenge is, how to end this cycle of violence, how to move away from our preoccupation with criminal justice, which perpetuates a name and shame culture of identifying individual perpetrators and holding them accountable, all in the name of human rights. I suggest we think of group violence as political. I suggest we address the issues around which constituencies are organized, recognize that the group violence has a political character, once we shift attention from perpetrators to issues and bring these to the heart of the discussion, to the center of the bargaining table, we begin a process that has the potential of turning enemies into adversaries. It's a really, it's a really powerful idea. Sujit, if I can ask the same question to you, survival, how does that come up? 
Um, yeah, so I don't think I use the word survival in my book, but of course it's about the persistence of indigenous perspectives through this tremendous period of change, the age of revolutions. And so if I were to think with survival for you, maybe one way to do so is to say that the argument is about indigenous presence, assertion, resistance, organization in the face of the ons onslaught of this enormous wave of imperialism. And so to survive is to face that imperialism. But the precise dynamic is that that imperialism presents a whole series of false promises. Um, and we see that, for instance, uh, with the Aboriginal peoples who I've just mentioned, because um, I juxtapose the story, in fact, of Cora next to the story of Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples and women in particular who take the lead in sealing um, and who teach escaped convicts and stowaways uh, who are men um, how to seal. Um, and, and they meet this sort of very uh, patriarchal humanitarian program of protection, quote unquote, which is the language that's utilized. Uh, and that in turn sees them relocated to another island, Flinders Island in the 1830s, where their numbers really decline. So to survive actually means that you've got to face all of these false promises and genocide, by the way, in Tasmania as well, um, and to keep going and to keep going. Um, and Tasmanian Aboriginal scholars today would say that they have survived to this date because their descent lines have carried, despite uh, really the depopulation which we saw at that moment of the Tasmanian Wars. So I guess survival is a particular thing for Indigenous peoples and a particular thing if you've got to face settlement colonization. And um, it takes a particular form in relation to the promises uh, of liberal imperialism um, as well. Thanks, Sujit. I loved reading about the sealers and the various characters that you introduced us to. Really incredible. Cal, how does survival come up in abandoned places? Yes, I, I, I talk in the book about how initially I thought that the, the human stories of my abandoned places would be present only in a negative. Um, and in fact, what I did find when I went to every location was that human presence had lasted into the present in some form and often that uh, that would be people who had returned to places they have been excluded from or um, people who simply can't sort of let go of place and so I think in in terms of survival I think of the the survival of community in some form um, and communities in, in different scales um, for example, in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, I, I found a, a small community of people who had essentially broken back in. They simply couldn't adapt to life in what was to them another culture. They couldn't become urban people. And so they decided against, you know, all odds against great physical risk to themselves to return to their homes, which were now an irradiated environment and take their chances. And that spoke to something very profound, I think, about the way that people relate to place and the, the way that people feel the need to keep some kind of identity flowing forwards into the future. And then, of course, there's the um, analogous um, stories that I found in, in the natural world, which was the, the different ways that, that plants, animals and so on have also found to survive in these deeply polluted places. Yeah, you took us to some really fascinating places, Cal. Um, you have all researched your books over a, a long period of time. I wonder how much your own thinking evolved along the way. Were there things that you thought you knew about or thought you understood that you then changed your mind on later on, Sujit? Um, yeah, so um, this book was written across a whole series of sites uh, in the Global South, and I really benefited, I should say, by talking to scholars in the Global South, in universities, um, in archives, um, um, alongside, um, just working alongside people doing the same research, uh, was really fundamental. And I guess the thing that really surprised me most, and um, I, mean, I don't think I kind of changed my view fundamentally in some ways, but I actually sort of had to fill in my imagination in new ways in order to think about the connections and modes of solidarity across the global south. So just discovering that, that there were all these embassies that came to Mauritius, a uh, Republican, uh, a re site of Republicanism from across the Indian Ocean, uh, seeking for assistance um, against colonialism and against um, the British in particular, or seeing the, the number of fighters that moved across the Bay of Bengal um, in this era of global war. Um, or yeah, the connections really in, across the Tasman Sea um, between um, um, colonial programs, but more importantly, indigenous programs uh, really um, as well. So I guess that surprised me because 
the field that I work in has been structured by concepts like nation and area and language and region. Um, and it actually sort of required me to correct those biases and to imagine differently and to learn from scholars uh, in the global south. And so that was a fundamental challenge, in addition, of course, to immerse, immersing myself with objects and images and archives uh, in those sites. So that was really the experience that I benefited most from and learned most from, and that changed me as a historian. You're being very humble about it, Sujit. Um, Cal, how about you? Did you unlearn things along the way? Yes, absolutely. And I have to say, I find writing nonfiction to be a sort of constantly humbling process in as much as I now find it difficult to, to be certain that I have any opinions at all, because any opinion that you hold is only one fact away to being disproven and having to completely rethink your worldview. So I do, I do find um, that writing has constantly got me sort of, I don't know, it feels like it shakes like the, the, the basis on which many of your beliefs are are held. Um, I do also think it's very important in, in writing to include um, mistakes that you've had in your own thinking or even um, especially um, irrational thoughts that you have yourself and, and to include that because I think also the readers are very likely also to have either the same wrong intuitions or the same um, mistaken beliefs and so by sharing your own I think that that can help sort of open people's hearts and open people's minds to realizing that they too might have ill opinions as well. And how about you Mahmoud? Well for me there were uh, two important moments of unlearning, uh, one at the beginning and the other towards the end of the process. Uh, the beginning we're talking of over two decades now um, the beginning was my first trip to South Africa. I had already written a manuscript. Only one chapter remained on apartheid. I took a research fellowship of three months in Durban to research that chapter. It took me less than that time to realize that I had been living under apartheid my whole life. I was no stranger to it. It made me see through my own game that I too had bought into the idea that apartheid was an exception with the illusion therefore that I and those who lived with me had clean hands. I threw away the manuscript, I returned home, Kampala, and I started again. The second moment of learning was just before I wrote my final draft. I was beginning to theorize, to try and understand decolonization in its political sense I began by questioning the conventional understanding that colonialism had deprived the colonized of independence uh, from the outside and that declaring a political independence from the outside again was the first step in decolonization. So political decolonization was for me then an external act, declaring sovereignty in the world. My next move a new one came from the realization that colonialism had actually reconfigured the inside, the conquered political community by drawing or redrawing boundaries, boundaries between races, tribes, religions. Each boundary, race, tribe, religion became the basis of an identity as it was freshly politicized by making it the subject of its own legal regime either civil law for the so-called civilized or customary law for each colonized tribe and religion. It is these legal regimes that justified why belonging and non-belonging should be the basis of privilege or deprivation. But the change was justified as preserving an age-old custom or culture. So until then I had been preoccupied with the question of justice. But I now realize that before what one could think of justice, whether criminal or political or social, one had to rethink the community of belonging, the political community, because the parameters of the political community would be the parameters of justice. You can, know, you can have justice only for those who belong to a common political community. It's really incredible hearing about these moments of awakening that you had along the way. I think it's really astonishing. And I think that comes across in your work. Um, you've led us on quite nicely to the point about process. Um, one of the things that's quite important 
for us as jurors at the British Academy Prize is looking at work that's really rigorous academically, but also appeals to a general reader and is something that a general reader could pick up and take something from. And you all managed to achieve that beautifully. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your process. Who are you thinking about when you're writing? How do you craft your work so that it maintains that academic rigor, but can still be accessible? Cal, could we start with you perhaps? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that question of accessibility is very important to me. Um, I think from, from my point of view, if you can write about something simply, it means that you really understand it. Um, and it's very easy to write about something that you don't quite understand in a very florid, um, flowing way and sort of skirt around the, the, the tr truth of the issue. And, and for me, writing is often I, I begin with large amounts of words and it's a process of sculpting down, down, down and down until I feel that I found the, the clearest path through. Um, when I am writing and especially when I'm feeling overwhelmed with the, the sheer amount of, of of data or, or um, information that I would like to include. I often open an email, I address it to my friend Samira, and um, I start writing and I say, Dear Sam, I'm writing um, th about this um, and it's difficult, but it's about X, Y and Z. And usually because she's a very intelligent person, um, but she often um, doesn't have a background in what I'm writing about, I will write it in a very clear way and I'll bring in the most interesting things. And I think that keeping that sort of color and, and that sort of simplicity of, of narrative is, is really important and really hard. But often I find by the time I've got to the end of that email, I've actually written the passage that I was finding difficult. I just take her name off the beginning of it and then I can almost copy and paste it directly into my document and job done. So that's my special trick. <laughs> That is such a great tip. I'm definitely using that one in future. Mahmoud, how about you? Is it a similar process? Not really. And I think I'm going to use the same tip. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, writing letters to people, letters you never send them, but you reread them and, and you realize what it is you were trying to say. So uh, writing cannot just be an accumulation of facts. A, a, a writer who remains preoccupied with accumulating facts and only facts, I think risks drowning the reader in a sea of facts. A, nor can writing just be about a narrative, a, as if the writer is a, like a spider spinning a web. Uh, something in the narrative tends to strike the reader as real, as familiar, and provide the reader with an anchor. Um, so I think it, the challenge is this balance, this tension between facts and narrative. Thank you. Sujit, how about you? Yeah, so in writing this book, I was quite conscious that I was trying to do something which was decolonial in many ways, namely to take a Eurocentric narrative, one which is really familiar, which is about the age of revolutions, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and so on, and to take it somewhere where it hadn't been before. But then how to bring it to a public audience, and so um, really to foreground people uh, was uh, my answer to that problem. Um, people of colour uh, in the Global South. But having sort of come to that realization, I, I sort of decided to continually decenter the people I was foregrounding. Meaning that um, for a general reader, um, an iconic life can be of interest, but one then needs to move from it to something else and from that to something else. So just as an instance of this, um, the material on the Gulf, which actually looks from Bombay as well as from Russell Heimer and Amman, um, yes, the Parsi shipbuilders, who are reasonably well-known feature, uh, they, they work out of Bombay and they build ships for the East India Company, uh, and they're um, socially mobile, uh, they feature uh, in that chapter. But then to descend to the Parsi shipbuilders by thinking about enslaved people um, and so-called Laskas, sailors, uh, moving across from um, Bombay to the Gulf and mounting rebellions um, and mutinies uh, in turn, uh, and to think about a whole series of different trading goods as well, and traders uh, who moved in that space. So to co constantly kind of decenter, and in that act to actually bring the environment to life as well, which I think is really significant for our current moment, um, because there is an environmental dimension. The seals 
by the way, do matter in the story on, about ceiling um, and their perspective, in a sense, it sort of makes space for nature much more fully as well. So, so, so in a sense, to see decolonization um, of historical practice as continuous and never finished uh, via elite to non-elite, uh, via the urban context to um, the frontier, um, men to women, um, and so forth, and so forth, really. Um, and so, yeah, to, in a sense, build on what the reader is interested in a particular elite life, perhaps, possibly, but to actually sort of take it in a different direction um, by way of social positionality or even geography. It's great hearing you unpack all the layers of writing that you've, that you've got in your book. So I want to move away from process back to your subject matters. And I wonder how the pandemic and all the social and political change that has come with it, and perhaps we don't fully understand the social and political change that's come with it, has affected your subject area? How is it going to change our understanding um, of your subject area? And, or how should it? Mahmoud, can we start with you? Sure. Well, I think uh, the pandemic has, uh, has capsulated long-term trends uh, in, uh, in a brief moment, in a sense. Uh, it's also making more and more people think beyond imperatives. Uh, what you're constantly told uh, in, in media, uh, like be fully vaccinated, wear the mask, to asking questions like what happened to our health system? Why are so many communities without clean water? Why are vaccines and masks not distributed globally? We begin to connect the dots, not just in the communities in which we live, but also beyond these, to our neighbors near and far. Thank you. Suja, do you agree with that? Is that something that you recognize too? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one can approach the pandemic in terms of its social impact, and uh, I'm very keen on that. But actually, I, I have, the book was finished, by the way, thankfully, before the pandemic um, struck. Um, and I was just really glad to write the last line of it um, and send it off. Um, well, I think it was just sort of the news was sort of breaking. Um, but I have written on the pandemic more recently. And my starting point with the pandemic is to insist that the pandemic and the environmental crisis are interlinked. Uh, they're conjoined crises. And if we think about them as conjoined crises, we need to recover the perspective of indigenous peoples because indigenous peoples are at the frontier of the environmental crisis and they engage with nature uh, very differently. Um, and so actually, I think kind of working with indigenous uh, historiography and uh, the literature on indigenous peoples uh, is, is really, really important for this moment uh, of the pandemic. So I wrote on the pangolin, um, who of course might be one of the creatures who is significant um, for the transmission of COVID uh, across species. Uh, and my point is that indigenous peoples in South Asia have a very different relation with the pan pangolin to the capitalized uh, heavy killing that characterizes human engagement in Asia with the pangolin now, which perhaps is one of the contexts really uh, for COVID-19. So we need to kind of think beyond our structures. Uh, the pandemic actually insists that we do so in terms of our structures of knowledge to make more space for environmental approaches and to make more space um, for indigenous knowledge. Um, I mean, that would be my response um, to the pandemic question. That links to you, Cal, the point about uh, environmental damage. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, one. Oh, I think we, Cal, may be having some, some technical difficulties there. I think not the only one who can't hear her, right? So, okay. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to Cal as soon as we can get her. I think we're getting some technical difficulties hearing her. Um, can you hear me? I'm going to move on to another question in the meantime. Um, it's one we've asked you to think about a little bit. Um, which one politician or public figure would you most like to read and engage with the ideas of your book, Mahmoud? Well, I had to think through this one several times. My first uh, inclination was not to answer it. Uh, but, but here's my answer. Um, I, I didn't have politicians in mind when I wrote the book for one reason. Uh, politicians are seldom moved by reason. Uh, their eyes on the latest opinion poll. They respond to public pressure. So I had in mind those 
uh, behind this public pressure. I had in mind teachers and students, preachers and community activists, mothers and daughters, sons and fathers, anyone who reads and has the guts to speak and to change their mind. But if you must insist that I name a politician. I insist. I I, okay, I, I knew you would insist. And so I put down two names to, to <laughs> politicians who you may send this book to. I would suggest either Mr. Narendra Modi uh, or Mr. Yoweri Museveni. I think we will ask the British Academy to dispatch those books shortly. Um, I think Cal has just come back. Cal, you had some technical difficulties, but we've got you back. We, I think you were trying to tell us about the environmental impact and how the pandemic has changed your thinking or developed your thinking on that. Just, just tell us a little bit about that again. That's right. Um, so I think uh, one thing that happened to us early on in, in the first lockdown was that many of us saw these very striking images of, of deserted streets and empty city centres and there was a lot of discussion about various species sort of reclaiming these streets right before our eyes, you know, these goats running around and running amok in, in Wales and, and um, Pumas, I think, in San Diego, kangaroos in, in downtown Adelaide. Um, and I think my immediate reaction was that this was too fast, you know, that this was not the abandonment that I was writing about, but this was some kind of related force at work. And what it really showed us was the way that we coexist with nature on a daily basis without necessarily realizing it. And that all it took for it to show its face was for us to withdraw for a few days or weeks. Um, and suddenly, you know, they had the, the, the bravery to, to start walking around in broad daylight in our streets. And so I think it shows how closely our, our spheres of influence already um, intersect with the different species that make up the natural world. And um, I think many people find something very moving in that. And um, I think that also shows, you know, how quickly human dominated spaces can begin to sort of fall from our control. And it's the same processes at work just over a much larger scale as that I was writing about in my own book. Thanks, Carl. I'm going to bring you back in on the question we've just been discussing, but Eddie has just joined us. And so I just want him to introduce his book briefly for a minute. So, Eddie, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us and tell us a little bit about your book. First of all, I'm so excited to be here and thank you all for your patience. I, I had to teach. Uh, so we ran from class to here. Uh, it's such an honor to be uh, a part of these wonderful books and these extraordinarily brilliant people. So um, I found myself in 2016, uh, trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces. The United States had decided to elect Donald Trump. And I was wondering, in fact, I was fearing for my own son. I kept saying to myself over and over again, oh my God, look at what they've done. They've done it again. And now my baby will have to endure this. And so as I was trying to figure out America's latest betrayal when it came to race matters, I knew that James Baldwin had experienced a moment in which the country had turned its back on its promise. And so I returned to the ruins as Baldwin described his corpus, not the early Baldwin, which most folk tend to gravitate towards. Right? They wanna to read notes of a native son. They want to read Giovanni's room or go tell it on the mountain. But I wanted to deal with the Baldwin that was as a, at least as people say, bitter, anger, angry, rageful. Um, and so it was the later Baldwin that I turned to, particularly the book, No Name in the Street. And so what I found myself doing is trying to unlock that text to help me respond to our current moment. So I wrote a book where I was writing with Baldwin about America's latest betrayal when it came to race matters, trying to figure out how we might imagine a way forward and begin again. And that, that's the book. In a nutshell. Eddie, thank you so much. And it's great that you're part of this conversation. And as I was saying, I've spent a, a lot of time with your books, as did the other jurors. We enjoyed them very much, and they're so powerful in their own right. So we were just discussing which politician or public figure you might like most to read your book. And I wonder if you could answer that one for us, Eddie. Mahmoud's just been giving us his thoughts. Yeah, right now, it would be President Joe Biden. Right. Uh, might be Boris Johnson, right? Um, uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, uh, to get folks to, to really confront how their race thinking 
is reproducing right conditions for the distribution of advantage and disadvantage in the specific context of the United States to get to get to get to urge President Biden to understand the the significance the magnitude of the choices being made now to not to not fall into the farce of America of America's choices or better not to succumb to America's latest expression of its madness when it comes to uh, race matters. Uh, so yeah, actually, um, I had an opportunity to hand it to him, but I, I thought that was a bit crude and crass. So. Well, you should have. You should have handed it to him. <laughs> Cal, I know you don't like this question, but I'm going to press you for an answer. Which politician or public figure needs to read your book? Oh, you know, Eddie had a, a, a great point on Bolsonaro in Brazil. I think that he's a, sort of one of the people in the world that is is causing such a, a great deal of environmental damage today. And um, I think we need strong leadership in Brazil that, that appreciates the value of the, the Amazon under his control and, and how that impacts not only on his country, but on the rest of the world and our future collectively as a species. Thank you. You did have an answer after all. <laughs> when, uh, I proved it off somebody else. So. <laughs> Thank you. Sujit, the same question to you. Yeah, so I actually totally agree with Mahmoud on this. I didn't really have politicians in mind. And in many ways, um, really, what would make me most happy is if the general public read it. I would add, actually, the general public in the sites covered in the book as well. And that's mm. incredibly difficult to achieve. And I raised this point at the British Academy, partly because I think it's worth raising at the British Academy, the book trade is structured so that it's impossible in many ways for this book to get to Mauritius, to get to Tasmania, to, you know, just so, so difficult for this to happen. So in some ways, yes, the general public uh, in each of the sites, and perhaps, in fact, if you ask for a politician, um, I mean, possibly, you know, President Min Sui of Myanmar or Prime Minister Pravind Jagnath of Mauritius or Scott Morrison of Australia, really people who could make more space in institutions, in, um, in public life um, for indigenous scholars and indigenous peoples to make their voices heard. Um, I mean, that would be really, really wonderful um, because really the aim of the book is to make space for allyship with indigenous peoples and people of color in the global South. So yeah, so if they can do that and if, yeah, let's hope, <laughs> but really the general public in each of the sites, I would say primarily. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of world leaders who needs to be sent this short list of books now. So um, we need to get straight on to it. But that, that was great. Thank you. Um, Eddie, since, since you joined us a little later, I would just like your reflections on perhaps um, one area that we've heard from the others about. And that is, I wonder how your own thinking changed in the process of writing this book. Were there things that you unlearned or changed your mind on along the way? You know, that's a great question. I think more than anything, Baldwin is an exacting companion. He demands a kind of honesty um, that I wasn't quite prepared for. I had been evading him for a reason because I didn't want to deal with my own wounds. And I remember, you know, literally hearing his voice as I was struggling to get sentences on the page that would jump, right? If we're going to do this together, oh boy, you're going to have to deal with you. You know, and, and that meant I had to deal with the fact that I'm a wound, I'm still a wounded little boy who has daddy issues. And, and to move that beyond the kind of personal, Baldwin holds the assumption to say any, or he holds this view to say anything substantive about the world, the messiness of the world, you have to first deal with the messiness that is you. That the messiness of the world is actually a reflection in so many ways of the messiness of our individual selves. And so uh, I found myself right, uh, growing up as I grappled with Baldwin's demand that I do so. Um, and that was hard in some ways. Um, I, I drank too much Irish whiskey as a result. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good admission to make. <laughs> So we're now gonna open up for audience questions. And just a reminder, you can post your questions in the Q&A function and they will magically via the Bridget Academy wake, make their way to me and I can read them out. Um, we already have one specifically for Cal. Um, and Cal, someone would like to know, that they said that they've read your book and they absolutely love it and learnt a lot from it, but they don't know where it belongs on the bookshelves. 
Is it a nature book? Is it a science book? Is it a travel book? Uh, adventure stories? Is it literature, reportage, or science writing, or all of them? Oh, How? Um, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. I suppose when I was writing it, I sort of assumed it was a nature book, and then well, when I embarked on it, I assumed it was a nature book. And then over the course of writing about it, um, I find it is impossible to write about nature without also writing about people, partly because of our omnipresence across the world um, and how almost no site, no matter how, how pristine it might appear, is, is unaffected by our presence on the planet. Um, but also because um, our way of understanding other species is so tied up with our own understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. So I think, um, yes, in many ways, it's a book about conservation, but it became, to me, uh, uh, a book also about, yes, yeah, psychology and, and I suppose, social structures and how they change. So um, I don't have a great answer to that. I suppose I assumed at the beginning it would be on nature, but I'm very happy to see it on any shelf anywhere. <laughs> fluidity of bookshelves that's good I wonder what the others have um if the others have thoughts on their books and where they would like them to sit or if there's a did it start out in a particular genre and end up in another Sujit um well I'm employed as a historian so I suppose I should say history <laughs> because um that would be in keeping with um my contract um for the university but um you know various people have written to say this is not the history that they know or this is not really their kind of history and so forth and so forth and I just think tough you know in a sense um, we need to stretch the classifications I mean that would be a way of answering the question right I don't agree with the classifications being rigid um, and I think the problem is that um, the histories that we tell have created these classifications in exclusionary ways and for certain kinds of people to do certain kinds of things and so, um, yeah, I agree with Cal, any, any, any shelf is okay. Um, but I think also we are at a point where really interesting writing is happening, which actually bends the categories. Um, and I think Mahmoud's and Eddie's books as well actually do that, by the way. Um, and I think we need, need more of that. We need people to be challenged, to actually ask this question and actually puzzle over it and, uh, and try and figure it out and kind of think, oh, well, the map is changing with knowledge. Yeah, and it's it's great to see the challenging of structures, even in the book in the, the setup of the books that you write. Mahmoud, is your is your book a call to arms in many ways? It's also a call to disarm. <laughs> um, so it uh, depends on who you're talking about, but uh, not not a call to arm. I mean, I I last week I saw the uh, the, the the Soviet production of War and Peace. Uh, done in 1966 or 68, and uh, and and the voiceover, uh, um, uh, um, you know, instead of collapsing time, sort of tries to give Tolstoy's moral message uh, at key points in the in the film. And and one of the points was always that uh, uh, one of the points was that uh, uh, the ideas that move the world and change the world are very simple ideas. Uh, so if uh, if uh, evil men and women have come together for a purpose, it is time for good men and people to come together. Mm. Very simple idea, um, but uh, but that's a call to arms, um, and I would agree with that. Yes, it certainly is. Um, Eddie, we have a specific question from the audience for you. Um, the person is asking you. You said you'd been avoiding Baldwin. What was it that made you feel the time was right? And you, you sort of alluded to this earlier, but expand on it for us. Well, you know, I've, you know, I've been teaching Baldwin for about 30 years. And it wasn't, because, you know, I, I, I first encountered him seriously in graduate school. And I didn't want to read him with my colleagues because, he's, cause, because he, made, he made faces flush, cheeks turn red. So not only did I have to deal with what Baldwin was asking of me, I had to deal with how my white colleagues were responding to him. And I just wasn't ready for that, right? Um, and so when I finally taught Baldwin, I taught Baldwin um, alongside Toni Morrison's Beloved. It's a wonderful juxtaposition actually. And um, he became, he started to come alive for me, right? And, and then I felt confident enough to deal with, with me. Um, and so I think it was a kind of 
evolutionary process of just maturing as a teacher and as a writer, a kind of confidence of standing in his room, right? Sitting with him next, sitting next with him in his room because if, and not trying to imitate him uh, because, you know, Baldwin could run over you like a, a beer can in the street if you try to. Um, so, so it was really, I, I've been teaching him and I knew he had the resources. So I retreated from the chaos of Trumpism into the storms of Baldwin. Um, and because I needed the resources to pick up the pieces because I was falling apart. And I knew he offered, he offered me resources to, do, to put myself back together and to offer resources for these young folk uh, who had fought so hard and the, and the nation responded with Donald Trump. So you're offering that retreat to others through your work, which is really Absolutely. fascinating. Um, Cal, we've got another specific question for you, which is how do you respond to the fact that abandoned places often elicit a romantic impulse among tourists while they also harbor decay and lost hopes? Yeah, I think this touches on something that we spoke about collectively a, a, a few days ago about this sort of heavy aestheticizing of abandonment. Mm. And I think that this, I've started coming to think of uh, abandoned places hit this almost like uncanny valley and, and, and in between sort of inhabited and uninhabited. And for some reason that becomes this, this point at which we find them very sort of emotionally um, invigorating and and for two different reasons I think and one of them is I, th I think that we have a, a very strong negative reaction um, to abandonment and that's for for good sort of um, um, good reason really but it's because of abandoned places are, are often tied together with um, high crime rates or, or sort of ill effect on, on mental health. And in many cities around the world, um, large areas of, of derelict land is often sort of goes hand in hand with that. Um, but then we also have this sort of sense of, of freedom, of, of detachment from, from the control of, of society. And so I think that's why people are drawn to them. And that's where the romanticizing comes from. It's almost a, uh, I, I talk about it as being, related to that experience of the sublime that we might have in in wild places like the top of a mountain or or a very wild forest something that that frightens us but also gives us this great sense of expansion in ourselves and so i think that that's what people are looking for when they go to these places but it's um i think it was henry james who described his ruin questing as being an inhumane pastime and that's because if you if you detach these aesthetic landscapes from the human stories that have led to this point, um, I guess you lose a great depth uh, of, of experience in that place, but also it's, it's, it's an unethical way to approach it. So I think that that's very important never to, to detach the, the present moment from the, from the past. I suppose reattaching ourselves to nature as we think about climate change is something that comes up ever more. Um, a specific question for Mahmoud from an audience member who says that they attended an inaugural lecture that you delivered at the University of Cape Town on a topic similar to the title of your book. And they want to know, has anything changed from the context of when you delivered that particular lecture? I'm not sure what year that was, perhaps you can tell us. Hmm. I'd love to know what year it was. <laughs> um, I think it was probably uh, four or five years ago. Um, when I was likely into the uh, second draft of my book uh, and between then and now um, there have been uh, at least three other drafts uh, then and when the book was published last year three other drafts and I think the big change uh, was about uh, uh, the, my realization that uh, the, the, the things I was talking about you know I was talking of uh, I was talking of justice, I was talking of uh, our preoccupation with avenging the dead. Uh, I was talking of the need to give the living a second chance. Um, and, 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 then, and then it dawned on me that really uh, what I'm talking about is, or what one needs to talk about is, uh, is rethinking and recreating. Uh, the political community is uh, is redrawing political boundaries, um, is is uh, expanding 
the the not only the reach of the law but also uh, the the access to law um, so that uh, it redraws the line between inclusion and exclusion. Um, so this is what changed. Thank you. And a specific question for Sujit. Uh, there's such a wealth of material uh, in your book. Uh, are you thinking of a second part? Do you think that there is there is more that you could do with that material? Um, so I don't think I'm going to, I mean, I'm not the sort of person who wants to write the same book again, um, because I think it's, you know, I've done it. And um, and I think you're, 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 the, the question is absolutely right. There, it, it's got a huge span to it from the Arabian Peninsula to the South Pacific. So I think I'm quite ready for something much smaller. And um, I'm actually sort of wondering about working on Sri Lanka uh, again, uh, which is where I grew up, and uh, writing on Colombo, which is um, a key site for the rise of China. It's probably going to double in population size. Um, so, um, so no, I don't. I'm not I'm not waiting to write a sequel. Um, I think you know it's done, and it's time to move on to something else. Um, but certainly, I think the questions of the book, in terms of environmental change and how environments structure politics. Um, and create possibilities um, for um, communities, but also for um, authoritarian regimes. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll carry on being ones that I work, work in. Excellent. We've only got about five minutes left. So if anyone has any burning questions from the audience, please pass them on really quickly uh, so we can get um, perhaps one last question around. Um, actually, on that note, Sujit, about what you're doing next, I mean, really looking forward to seeing your work on Sri Lanka. I would quite like to hear from the others if you're happy to share what you're working on next, whether it's a book or a particular piece of work, Eddie. Right now I'm trying to figure out how to uh, describe what I, the phrase that I used earlier, American madness. What happens when you tell yourselves what happens when a nation repeatedly tells itself a lie? Um, and, and how that can evidence itself uh, in these political fevers, not necessarily panics, but fevers that, that um, currently threatens the body politic in the United States. Right? There, it is a serious question whether or not American democracy will survive this particular round of madness. And so I'm thinking about that very carefully. Ahab returns. <laughs> okay, that's somewhere. quite that, that. That is quite the task, I'm sure. Hal, <laughs> tell us, tell us what you're working on, if you're happy to share. Of course, um, at quite an early stage, so I imagine this will change before it ever makes it to to sort of the public. But um, I'm really interested in, um, I suppose where spirituality and landscape meet. So um, various places around the world which have this strong effect on us and um, they affect us, I suppose, um, and what it is about our minds that responds to place in that way. Thank you. And also the same question to Mahmoud. Well, I'm currently preparing uh, three lectures I've been invited to give at the University of California, Irvine, and those three are supposed to appear as a book. Um, and these uh, lectures are about the scholarship on slavery. Uh, it, it, they're about uh, uh, how American scholars, American historians, uh, who, who wrote on plantation slavery, um, then uh, uh, in the midst of this realization that really there were not many examples of this around the world, uh, maybe ancient Greece and uh, maybe sections of, uh, of Rome, um, uh, but not much else. Uh, then, then turn around to, to, to look for slavery everywhere um, and, and, and define slavery as a, as a system completely out of context. Uh, defined it uh, totally in modern terms. And so the book is about uh, how, what happens when you wear a particular set of, set of lenses, which have been crafted in a particular context, but now um, use them to understand everything else. Thank you so much. That, that sounds quite daunting too, I have to say. Um, we have one last question from the audience for all the authors. So I'm gonna ask each of you, do you have any sense about how different audiences across the world 
are responding to your writing. And I suppose it's a little bit harder because of the pandemic. Perhaps you haven't been able to travel as much as you would have liked. But I wonder if you have have got a sense, certainly through online interactions, etc. Sujit. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I've really missed because of the pandemic, um, because as I said earlier, I really wanted to, to discuss this book um, in various places in the global south. However, I was able to go to Sri Lanka and um, it was really, really interesting to discuss this book uh, in a Sri Lankan context where I guess, yes, I mean, it's an ultra-nationalist state, uh, which is turning in more and more on Sinhalese Buddhism. Um, and to actually sort of present an argument which is about the engagements between Burma, Myanmar, Java, Sri Lanka, uh, the passage of Buddhist reform, of monks, of fighters, of warfare, of militarism, um, really in that, um, uh, in that watery space. Um, yeah, I felt really, really good because it's, it's a route out of uh, a na narrowly nationalist uh, narrative. Um, and it also presents other modes of imagining, um, modes of resistance, um, and um, modes of even cosmopolitanism, though I suppose that's, that's problematic to use it like that. Um, yeah, so it, it was really fun and it really enthused me and um, yeah, um, I wish for more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just before I come to the others, I should point out the event is being recorded. It's going to be shared on the British Academy's YouTube channel via the website and social media. Um, and the London Review of Bookshop will also be putting out a recording. So uh, if you'd like to share this with friends and you think there are others who should listen to the fascinating conversation tonight, please do share it with them so we can get these, these books an even wider global audience. Cal, have you, have you heard from people around the world? Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, again, to I, I suppose a lesser, lesser extent than, than one might have expected in a normal year, but um, I have been really interested by a particular response from um, Italy, where um, I wrote an article around the time that my book came out in the UK, which talked about this sort of pattern of urbanization across the, um, I suppose, high income and also middle income countries that we're seeing. And that's very much the case in Italy, where there are huge areas of marginal farmland, as you might call it, um, being left to abandonment. And so you see huge amounts of forestry growth there. So I had quite a few people write to me from Italy um, to, to ask about that in particular, and I think that that's, uh, that's very much an issue that we were going to be reckoning with over the, the coming decades as countries around the world are more and more becoming very urban. Great, and Eddie, you've got a, a very clear American audience, but are you also hearing from others around the world responding to, to the way in which you approach Baldwin? Oh, absolutely, the book uh, came out in the midst of uh, the police murder of George Floyd and the protest around the world. Um, and so from Japan to the Netherlands to France, uh, I've, I've, I've had an extraordinary reaction to the work. Plus Baldwin was a global citizen, not just American, right? So it's been wonderful. Yeah, great, thank you. And Mahmoud, have you heard from audiences around the world also? I mean, you, you cover such as the, a span of geography in your book. Yeah, well, under the overarching argument of the book, I have a series of case studies. So it, the case studies are very focused and it's from these places that I've heard the most. So it's uh, Israel, Palestine, it is South Africa, it is uh, Sudan, um, it is uh, not yet Germany, but it is uh, uh, those working on uh, uh, Indians or natives in the US. Um, mm. So these have been my you know, main uh, engagements. Yeah. Quite, quite a diverse audience. And I'm afraid it is, um, it is seven o'clock here in the UK and we're gonna have to end this conversation there. Thank you so much to all four of our authors, Sujit, Mahmoud, Cal, um, and Eddie, thank you. I'm forgetting your names now by the end of it. Um, thank you so much for your amazing books and the fascinating conversation tonight. I know that that conversation is gonna continue. Um, don't forget you can refer to the British Academy website for further details about all of these books and the London Review Bookshop website is selling all of the shortlisted books so do check them out there and 5 p.m 26th of October is when we're going to be announcing the winner so watch out for that. Thank you so much to the authors and thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Thank you Fatima. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so thank you much. Everyone.